Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Catalina Gillies. The recent murder on Amelia Street has prompted Westford Ward Councilor Kristen Oliver to call on the district's social services board to increase safety at its buildings. The firearm-related murder on November 4th happened at Spence Court, an apartment building operated by the DSAB. Oliver is asking the board to add 24-hour security in the building and conduct a review of its eviction practices to see if stricter rules can be put in place. Oliver says after this latest incident, something has to change. Obviously, the homicide that we had in Spence Court um, certainly precipitated this call for action um, because, you know, the... This is, this is amping up to something far more severe than I actually thought it was going to get to. And, uh, and we have people, like I said, that have lived in this building for decades that are absolutely petrified. DSAP officials declined to be interviewed about Oliver's request. Though in wake of the Amelia Street murder, the organization stated that criminal activity is happening all over the city, not just at its properties. A judge has ordered that a $350,000 lawsuit filed against the city by St. Joseph's Care Group over pinhole leaks will move forward. The lawsuit was filed last November, just two days after a separate $350 million class action lawsuit was filed on behalf of potentially thousands of local homeowners who experienced pinhole leaks in their copper water pipes. The leaks are widely believed to be a result of sodium hydroxide that was added to the municipal water system to mitigate the health effects associated with lead pipes. The practice has since been discontinued. According to the statement of claim filed by St. Joe's, the first pinhole leak was discovered in its PR Cook apartment complex on Cary Street in 2018. Nearly 100 apartment units and other parts of the building are said to have sustained water damage since that time. St. Joe's estimate the cost of repairs at $150,000 and climbing. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting three new COVID-19 cases today. They all come from the Thunder Bay area. Two are close contact infections, while one exposure source is still unknown at this time. There are still 12 active cases across the region, no change from yesterday. There is one new case coming from the Northwestern Health Unit today, that's currently the only active case across its catchment area. The city of Thunder Bay is looking for opinions as it moves forward in its effort to reimagine the downtown North Core. A survey is now available on the city's website asking residents how they feel about the changes made to Red River Road and Cumberland Street this summer and what future improvements they'd like to see. Mitchell Ringos has the story. This summer saw a lot of change in the downtown North Core, and there is much more to come. But city administration is interested in hearing what the public wants to see out of the area. Pilot projects like a widened boulevard along Red River Road and increased angle parking on Cumberland Street have come to a close. Stephen Murphy is the project manager for the Reimagining the North Core Streetscape study and says now is the time to consult locals before moving forward. We had an opportunity to test some features, see what worked, uh, hopefully get uh, substantial feedback from the community, what they actually liked, so we could incorporate that in designs. Necessary replacement of the water main and sewer infrastructure in the downtown North Core brought forth the possibility of reimagining Red River Road. The city has ambitious plans for the downtown North Core, including wider pedestrian walkways, added greenery, space for events, and indigenous placemaking, just as a start. Information about the project can be found on the city website. Murphy is hopeful that the changes will attract more people to the area. I hope it will just um, bolster the community in this area. It will help make this more inclusive, accessible, a vibrant space and somewhere that a lot of people want to spend time and continue to spend time here. Now this new project in the downtown North Core will take some time to be fully finished with construction on Court Street starting in 2022 and plans for the project to be fully finished by 2024. But when it is done, Murphy believes it will be a new hot spot here in Thunder Bay. Mitchell Ringos, TBT News.
The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is sounding the alarm after a number of subdivisions have been proposed that use city water but private septic systems. The health unit says too many of these partial services lots could lead to a number of issues, including flooding and even toxic algae blooms in Lake Superior. Environmental Health Manager Lee Cisuerda says approving these lots put the city on a slippery slope. He calls it a bad development model. Council has decided it will not allow partial service lots in the meantime, while administration works with the health unit and the conservation authority to mitigate the risk going forward. Opposition to these lot styles isn't new. Areas in which they're allowed were cut back in both 2002 and 2019. Naming is now the only ward in which they're still permitted. Just seen recently a number of subdivision proposals come through that are proposing this and because they want to fit so many lots in they've had to the ministry of the environment requires them to do some hydrogeological studies and these hydrogeological studies have come back to say yeah there's going to be too much nutrient being discharged i don't think there's a, a good way to do it other than to reduce the number of lots such as ecoflow the report will come back in february of next year the goal is to protect the environment while also easing the burden on developers and homeowners. An idea hatched by Mayor Bill Morrow before the pandemic finally came to life this week. The mayor, councillors, city administrators and police officers faced off in a floor hockey game against students at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School. Danielle Bain was there to take in the action. Mayor Bill Morrow started off the floor hockey game with a few words for everyone, encouraging students to feel comfortable coming to him or other city officials with any issues they might have. He also asked the kids to take it easy on them when it came to the hockey game. Morrow thought the event was a huge success, especially for kids that might be new to the city. I think a lot of these young students, you know, coming to Thunder Bay can be a bit of an intimidating experience for them. Uh, some of them, you know, are here for the first time, some of them not. But it's just all about trying to create the relationships and make them feel more comfortable in the community. The city's team also included Fort William Chief Peter Collins and a number of Thunder Bay police officers. DFC student William Bottle had a great time playing against the mayor and the others and says he was excited to get a chance to speak with some of the police officers. And actually, policing is a career that I want to choose, so having to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one talk with them is very inspiring for my future. So. School principal Sharon Anjikoneb says having a police presence at the school in that setting was important for students to have a chance to relate to them. They're role models and that's, that's why they were here. They were having fun and they were showing, showing our students that they are easy to approach. You can talk to them, you know, you can approach them if you have any questions about anything. And it's like I said, they are role models. For Moro, the game was an awesome way to break down barriers and bring back some fun into the lives of students and city staff. For me, the evidence was just seeing the smiles. You know, you could see a lot of the, a lot of the students were, were just having a good time. And I think, you know, through, through sport, often a lot of barriers do break down. Most of us, I've been involved in sports my entire life, and your friendships are formed through sport, even with the teams and the athletes that you're playing against, right? You just create the relationship. Both the mayor and the principal of DFC were excited about the possibility of having another event like this, although next time they said they want to choose an event that's more appealing to the female athletes of the school so that they can participate as well. Danielle Bain, TBT News. The Ford government has set a big goal for electric vehicle manufacturing in Ontario. It wants manufacturers to produce 400,000 electric and hybrid cars by 2030. But as Colin DeMello tells us, rebates to purchase those vehicles aren't in the cards just yet. As gas prices continue to soar, the Ford government is getting on board with electric vehicles. The auto industry is changing as consumers demand a different kind of vehicle technology. And the industry is shifting rapidly and preparing to build the cars of the future. The province says over the next decade, 400,000 electric and hybrid vehicles will be manufactured in Ontario and will soon focus on battery production needed for the vehicles. We're going to shift gears towards new areas of opportunity, electric vehicles, electric battery production, state-of-the-art manufacturing technologies. We're not only going to stay ahead of the curve, we're going to lead that curve. 
At the same time, however, the Ford government doesn't seem to be willing to incentivize Ontario drivers to trade in their gas-powered vehicles for electric. Under the former Liberal government, drivers were offered $14,000 to buy an EV. That was scrapped shortly after the Ford government took office, driving down the number of electric vehicles sold in Ontario. The Premier suggested last week only millionaires can afford electric vehicles. No, we are bringing it back. I'm not going to give rebates to the buy guys that are buying 100 and some odd thousand dollar cars, millionaires. Today, the Premier is suggesting a slight change. You know, I'm, I just didn't believe in it. Let's see how the market dictates. But with no commitments on the table, it's unclear whether the province plans to make it cheaper to purchase a made in Ontario product. At the same time, the Ford government says it is focused on the price at the pumps. The Premier indicated last week that he wants to cut 5.7 cents per litre off the gas tax in Ontario before the next budget. At Queen's Park, Colin DeMello, CTV News. Thunder Bay's opioid crisis was a topic of discussion once again at Queen's Park today. Local MPP Judith Monteith Farrell is demanding more provincial funding for a mental health and addiction centre. The issue has garnered a lot of recent attention. Hundreds of people took part in a local overdose awareness walk last month. Monteith Farrell is echoing calls for a new 40-bed detox centre. The city currently has just 25 beds. The Ford government points to increase overdose prevention spending in the north, but Monteith Farrell says it's not enough. There have been approximately 3,000 admissions every year since 2017. But another 3,000 admissions are denied every year because every bed is in use. Our community desperately needs the province to step up. Premier, will this government commit to funding a community-based crisis centre in Thunder Bay? This is a problem that is facing all of the province of Ontario. And since the release of the Roadmap to Wellness, Mr. Speaker, we've made unprecedented investments totaling over $40 million in new ongoing annualized funding specifically to address the needs of those living with mental health and addictions challenges in Northern Ontario. Monteith Farrell notes opioid-related mortality rates across the Thunder Bay District Health Unit are 10 times higher than anywhere else in the province. Crowds will be transported to the high seas of the 18th century as Cambrian Players debuts its rendition of Treasure Island tonight. It's the group's first show since the pandemic began, and the local production company is putting a more inclusive spin on the swashbuckling tale of treachery and adventure. Flint was the bloodthirstiest buccaneer that ever sailed. Much of his enemies like they were pork. The story of Jim Hawkins and his search for Treasure Island features female characters, with many roles originally written as men recast as women. The Robert Louis Stevenson classic will have audiences on the edge of their seat. Secrecy and deceit abound as Hawkins and his crew try to escape the island with their treasure and their lives. Director Jordan Blacksill is excited to see the return of live theater and hopes his gender blinding casting, casting will resonate with viewers. Have the audience here in person and the actors just feet away from them is it's really a feeling that uh, both as an actor and as a director it's really difficult to replicate. It's just that connection that you feel with the audience um, as you're telling your story and showing uh, them your character is, is really second to none. Jim Hawkins challenges what a child could do. In this production, it's what could a young girl do? What is she capable of? And really fighting expectations of a girl stays at home. A girl doesn't go on adventures. And she's certainly not surrounded by other strong women who are finding their own path. A 100% capacity crowd is welcome with proof of vaccine necessary upon entry. Tonight marks the first of nine shows at the Spring Street location. For tickets, visit the Cambrian Players website.